Turn with me to the book of Luke, chapter 17. We're going to read God's word there. A man named Rick Elias tells his story. He said that he boarded a plane in New York City, January 15, 2009, headed for Charlotte, North Carolina. He said shortly after takeoff, there was a bang and the engine started making a terrible noise, but the flight attendant said he was sitting near the front. She said, no problem. We probably just hit a bird. But then the pilot said over the microphone, brace for impact. And he said, we're going down. Rick Elias said, everything changed in an instant. I suddenly thought of all the people I wanted to reach out to but didn't. All the fences I wanted to mend, but didn't. All the experiences I wanted to have, but never did. Fortunately, Rick Elias survived the crash. My point, it was an ordinary day. You got on, there was nothing boarding the plane to indicate that this would be any different than the many flights he had made before. Ordinary day, ordinary flight, if he had known before, maybe there are some things that he would have done differently. In our text, it makes a, says a phrase, as it was in the days of Lot. As it was in the days of Lot. And what this is speaking about is the fact that there is coming a point in time of judgment. This is in history, uh, looking ahead, that the Bible says there is going to be a moment in time, and that is the point at which judgment will begin. <clears throat> but it says, when judgment will begin, it will be just like the days of Lot. And so we need to consider that. I want to preach about the days of Lot. Let's read Luke 17, starting at verse 28. The Bible says, likewise... As it was also in the days of Lot, they ate and drank and bought and sold and planted and built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. Likewise, the one who is in the field... Let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, in that night, there will be two men in one bed. There one will be taken, the other will be left. Two women grinding together. One will be taken, the other left. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, and the other left. The days of Lot. Let's begin. I want to talk about the principle of judgment. As we begin, this text speaks about the days of Lot, and it is not just talking about days when he was alive. It is talking about a time when God brought judgment into the place where Lot lived. Genesis 18, 20, the Lord told Abraham, I've heard a great outcry from Sodom and Gomorrah because their sin is so Flagrant sin is rebellion against God. I don't care what flavor of sin, if that's immorality, bitterness, hatred, racial prejudice, uh, theft, I don't care what it is, drugs, alcohol. The form is not the point. The point is it is rebellion against God. And that is not acceptable to God. God is a God of justice and he wants justice. He wants things to be set right. The Bible tells us that God is holy. It is talking about the fact that God is pure. Holy means separate or different. God is always clean. He is always pure. He always does what is right. There are Ladies that are here, you cannot stand dirt. Your husband is astounded, has no idea what you're talking about. You get worked up because there's dirt 
the table, the floor is a mess, and your husband is like, and your point is, like, we, we, we view this differently, apparently. But the Bible says, a completely pure and holy God looks down and sees the impurity, the rebellion, the sin, and he cannot stand wrongdoing in his presence. And not only is he pure, because he is the creator, he is the one who makes the rules. He is the one from the beginning of time, he told Adam and Eve, you can eat of every single tree in the garden except that one. Why? Because I made the garden, I make the rules. And in life, God tells us, one of the things you'll find in the Bible is it tells us about sin. When people choose to rebel, he tells us the things that we involve ourselves in various kinds of sin. And the Bible says it grieves and offends him. Genesis 6, 6, when he saw the wickedness of man, it grieved him. That, that word grieved, it's, it's not just somebody looking down on people that are doing wrong going, Oh, yeah. It, it, it means offended, emotionally pained. And so this is how God views sin. So in the days of Lot, the Bible says that God makes a decision to judge sin. You need to understand this about God. God judges sin. He judges sin personally. Sometimes in people's lives, he will balance the scales. He will get involved. We read about a man in the Old Testament named Haman. Haman hated, he's prejudiced and filled with pride. He hated a man named Mordecai and erects a gallows. He wants Mordecai, his, the man who offends him, to be hung but God judges sin. God turned that around. It was not Mordecai that God judged. It was Haman. God does that sometimes. But our text tells us that God sometimes judges people as a group. Or in other words, the, the sins of the entire group, he judges at one time. Our text talks about the days of Lot. Lot lived in an area where there were two cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, very close to each other. And it's talking about a time when God judged both of these cities at the same time. Judges 19, 24, then the Lord rained down fire and burning sulfur from the sky on Sodom and Gomorrah. So the Bible said that God did it at that time now we're reading in the New Testament, Jesus takes that lesson from history and says, you better learn the lesson from this. In Sunday school, we're looking at the history of our church and fellowship. You have to learn lessons from history. Jesus says, the God that judged Sodom and Gomorrah because sin is unacceptable and offensive, that is what he still does. And there is coming a point in time where God's not going to judge just a person or a couple of cities. He's going to judge the entire world. Talks about a seven-year period where God will pour out judgment on the earth. You can read it in Revelations. It uses symbolic language. But the point is that more than two-thirds of the entire population of the world will die. There is no words that I could use to describe how horrific that, that will be. The Bible says those that don't die will wish they were dead. So in our text... Keeping that in mind that there is coming a judgment where God is going to judge the whole world, our text is saying, what is the trigger for judgment? What is it, what is the point in time at which now judgment is poured out? And verse 29 says, on the day that Lot went out. Of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. That, that's a key phrase. On the day that Lot went out. 
So this tells us something about God. I told you God is a God of justice. Sin must be judged and he does judge sin. But at the same time, there were some people living in, uh, uh, in Sodom that were not wicked like the rest of the people. Lot and some of his family, they were not living in sin like the rest of them. And so this tells us something about God because God is righteous. He does what is right. He does not want to judge righteous people with the wicked. Genesis 18, 25 uh, Abraham said to God, surely you will not destroy the good people along with the evil ones. Then they be treated the same. You are the judge of all the earth. Won't you do what is right? And God said, correct. That is absolutely right. I do not want to judge righteous people with wicked ones. There are people knowing that there is coming a point in time in which God is going to pour out his judgment in the earth in the seven-year period of the tribulation. There are people who are Christians or claim to be Christians, and they say, that's right, that's why you need to be buying guns and, and freeze-dried food and getting ready because we're going to be here during that seven-year period. Christians are going to be judged along with sinners. The problem with that is that violates the heart of God. It violates the pattern that he set. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9, God did not choose us to suffer his anger, but to have salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So as it was in the days of Lot, what God does he removes righteous people from judgment to clear the way for judgment upon sinners. If you go back in Genesis 6 to the days of Noah, the Bible it said God instructed him to build an ark. The first judgment of the world was through water, through massive flooding. Build an ark and Noah and his family went into the ark and the Bible says then the rains came. They did not suffer the rain with everybody else, but God saved them out of the water. In the days of Lot, the Bible says that Lot and his two daughters leave Sodom and Gomorrah. And our text says, on the day that they went out, then the fire fell. In our text, it tells us what is going to happen in our days. And it's speaking, saying, there is coming a great removal. Verse 34 through 36, three times it uses the word taken. Taken. It means to take up or to take away or re receive to oneself. First Thessalonians 4, 17, then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up. Same word, taken in the clouds to meet the Lord of the air, then we will be with the Lord forever. The Bible says this is the trigger for judgment because God does not judge righteous people with the wicked. His plan is not that we build boats. His plan is not that we move into the woods and build shelter. The Bible says we are going to be taken. This is the word we get Rapture, it is to remove quickly, as fast as you can blink, every true believer all across the world will suddenly be taken up to heaven. They will disappear from off of the earth and then that clears the way. Now sinners can be judged. Let's talk secondly about danger. Our text is a warning in advance so we can avoid judgment. This is the heart of God. Before he judged the earth with water in the days of Noah for 120 years, Noah preached judgment is coming. This is what God does. He warns that angels came and warned Lot and his family. And this is always in the heart of God. Knowing that the rapture is coming, knowing that judgment is coming on the earth, God gives us signs 
to alert us of what is coming. They say there are signs, if you are near the ocean, signs of a tsunami. If you're down near the ocean and you hear from the ocean a sound like a loud roar, like a, a train or an airplane and it's coming from the ocean, that's not a good sign. That's a bad sign. If you see suddenly that the water drains away rapidly away from the shore, not a normal tide, but in an instant, you better get off the beach. Signs, danger is coming. And so the Bible says, as it was in the days of Lot, he allows us to see what is going to put people in danger of missing the rapture, not being taken up, and instead being left here to face God judge, God's judgment. Number one, it is the ordinary life. Verse 28, likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate and drank and bought and sold and planted and they built. You know, our problem is, some of us, we've been raised on movie and TV. You can always tell when danger is coming in a movie, how? Music. Right? When I was a kid, the movie Jaws came out. Remember that? Swimming in the... Uh, dun, 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 dun. It's like, can't you hear the music? Get out of there! <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't that be nice if any time there was danger, dun, 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 wait a minute. <laughs> but the Bible says the danger for some people, that's not how life comes. The danger for some people, for many people, on the day that judgment begins, life will look today just like it did yesterday. You'll not wake up and there'll be weird signs in the sky, weird music. It will be an ordinary day and yesterday wasn't dangerous. So if today, if the sky looks the same, if I got to go to work just like I did yesterday, then probably today will not be dangerous as well. This is the problem. What God is saying, some people are lulled into a false sense of security. They are living in sin. They are not ready for judgment. So they are therefore in danger but because nothing outwardly appears to be dangerous, they will continue up until the moment judgment begins. It tells us a second danger, and that danger is looking back. Verse 31 and 32, Likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. In the story of Lot and the judgment that came on Sodom and Gomorrah, angels came to warn Lot, and he's like, apparently they're, they're originally kind of talking and discussing, and finally the angels say, we've got to go. You've got to get out of here. He had an uncle praying for him. And so here, let's go. They started out, they're leaving. The problem was Lot's wife Everything she loved. See, that's why the Bible says, love not the world. Everything she loved was back in Sodom. So they're headed in the right direction, good. They're headed in a way that will save them from judgment, good. But the problem is, in her heart, what she actually loved was back there. And so the Bible says... She kept looking back, and in a moment, judgment came upon her, and God turned her into a pillar of salt. The point of that is God hardened the decision. That's written as a warning to believers. You know, it's tragic, as it was in the days of Lot. There will be people who are going to face the judgment who were saved. They were on the way. 
They had prayed at some point. They had been making some good decisions. But the problem, like Lot's wife, they're continually looking back on the old life. Some people, they're looking back because they're trying to feel what they felt before. There are people who remember when they were young or they remember when they were not saved and there were some times that they had fun. And so they're looking back saying, man, I wish I felt like that again. There are some terms that are, they use today. They call it retro romance or retrosexuals. These are people who look up old boyfriends and girlfriends on the internet and make contact with them. Remembering when they were a teenager, my old high school Sweetheart, Professor Keith Campbell said you get a thrill out of finding an old girlfriend to see if she still likes you. You're curious to see what she looks like. It's easy to fantasize about alternative courses, alternative courses your life might have taken. In divorce today, they have a term that lawyers use. They call it Facebook affairs because people go on the internet. And one of the common phrases on Facebook is looking up somebody from the past I never got over you. But there are Christians that do that. I wonder. Don't. <laughs> Looking back, that's not good. There are people that are trying to feel what they missed out on. You know, there are people that they made decisions Maybe it was they just chose to get married very young. There are others, they had to get married because they got pregnant. Or they had to take responsibility after someone died in the family. So what happens to people is they say, it's not fair. And especially these are people who watch movies and TV and they, life should be like that. It's not fair. Here I got, a, I got, I got married and now I got kids and a responsibility I never got to enjoy my childhood. I never really got to have fun. And so they're looking back and the Bible says there are, do you know what? On the day that Jesus calls us home, there are going to be dumb Christians stuck behind because they're on Facebook and Instagram and some other stupid social media trying to recapture something from the past. And God says, as it was in the days of Lot, just like Lot's wife, that's what happened to her. God forbid, but there will be foolish Christians who their decision will become hardened in the same way. Thirdly, selfish living. That's the third danger. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. Some people don't want to pay the price of living for God. They will not make stands with their friends. They won't stand up for Jesus. Yeah, I want to get to heaven, but I don't want to be embarrassed. I don't want anybody to not like me. There are people, yeah, yeah, I want to go to heaven. Oh, yeah, but do I have to go to church? You know, it's such a nice day outside and we're stuck in here. They don't want to pray. They don't want to read their Bible. They don't want to tithe. They don't want to give God money, but, oh yeah, but I want to be saved. And the Bible says, whoever seeks to save his life, meaning selfishly, you live for yourself only, you're going to wind up losing it. You know that the city of Pompeii was destroyed by a volcano in an instant. A volcano exploded and suddenly millions of tons of ash dumped on the city of Pompeii. In later years, they have excavated and dug in that city, and they found the body of a woman who was entombed by the ashes. Her feet were toward the city gate. That's where she needed to be. They heard the explosion, get out of here as fast as possible, but her face, she's lying on her side, 
and her face is turned towards something that lay just beyond her hands. It was a bag of pearls. So they don't know, was she running for safety and dropped the pearls, or did somebody else drop them? And she thought, yahoo, free pearls, and the ashes dumped on her, and she is frozen in that. The pearls weren't worth it. And that's the problem. Listen, there is nothing worth going to hell for. There is no one worth missing the rapture for. And so the Bible says, as it was in the days of Lot, there is danger that God tells us about in advance. Let's talk finally about the separation. In our text, it tells us what's going to happen at the rapture. And this will play out all around the world. There will be separation. And it tells us three different scenarios, people together, one taken, one left. One taken, one left. In other words, there's a separation. The rapture will bring separation and it will reveal some things. The rapture is going to, through separation, reveal who are real Christians and those who are fake Christians. Some of you, if you witness, you, you often will run it. And yeah, I'm a Christian. How many of you know not everybody who says I'm a Christian is a Christian? There are people who will say the right words. When I went to South Africa, it originally spun my head a very, very religious. They'd been raised in religion. It had nothing to do with the way they lived. I, I, I had gangster, alcoholic, drug dealers that they would say, yes, I've been sanctified, washed in the blood. It's like, <laughs> you, you got the words, but uh, this doesn't match. When you walked into church today, we did not have a salvation meter at the door. Wouldn't that be nice? If you walk in, ah! Pastor Chris goes, come here, we need to talk. <laughs> You're not a real Christian because the salvation meter just went off. Or the sin meter <laughs> that, that may be a better way to look at it. And there are people who, who they, they are good at acting. They're good for he is Lord. <laughs> but the way they're living, he's not Lord at all. How are we going to know? The rapture. Because in every setting in the world, there will be people taken and there will be people left. And then you know who is real and who is fake. The rapture and the separation will reveal those who are doing right and those who are doing wrong. Matthew 7, 23, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You know the problem with sin is much of the sin you can commit, you can do in private all of you have your clothes on right now, and I'm very grateful for that. <laughs> but let's be honest, we're in church. It's when you're out of church. It's when there are no Christians around. In private, in the dark. No one else knows, but at the rapture, we're going to know. Luke 8, 17, there's nothing secret that won't be revealed, nothing hidden that won't be known and come to light. And of course, there are people, they're not doing right, but they think, well, I'll just get saved after the rapture. So you can't live for God now. After the rapture, you, the Bible talks about all those who will be killed So you can't live for God now, but you're going to die for him then. I don't think that that makes sense. 2 Corinthians 6, 6, 2, for he says, in an acceptable time, I've heard you. 
in the day of salvation, I've helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. August 5th, last year, 2022, Amber Escadero uh, Contostatis, she was waiting in Lafayette Square. She had just gotten off work. Lafayette Square is a public park just across the street from the White House in Washington. She had finished work, waiting for her husband to pick her up. When her husband was going to pick her up, they were going to go celebrate her 28th birthday. But before he could get there, a thunderstorm rolled in. So Amber and three other people, they huddled under a tree for shelter from the storm. Four of them were there. When in half a second, six lightning bolts struck. All four of them under the tree were knocked to the ground and all four of them, their hearts stopped. There were some people there, some nurses that immediately started working on them. But out of the four, only Amber could be revived. She was the lone survivor. James and Donna Mueller, who were celebrating their 56th wedding anniversary, and 29-year-old Brooks Lamberton, the three of them, they were killed by the lightning strike. Amber lived. And she said, I died and came back. No matter how tacky or cheesy it sounds, you don't know when your last day might be. That is just a, a little glimpse of what's going to happen all around the world. Four people, and in a moment, four of them are gone. Only one survived. That's what the rapture is going to be. Judgment is coming on the world. God is going to take every true believer. There'll be separation, and those left behind will now face the awesome wrath and judgment of God. But this was written because it doesn't have to be that way. It's written so those who are not saved get saved. There is no reason to put it off for another day. Because the Bible says no one knows the day or the hour. I cannot guarantee you that we'll even finish this day before the rapture will happen. It's written as a warning for those. You are like Lot's wife. You're here. You have started making good decisions, but you're looking back. You are in great danger because the Bible says, as it was in the days of Lot. Let's bow our heads. Close our eyes all across this place. Thank God. Now I give an opportunity for people that are here that are not right with God. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I want to give you an opportunity to turn from your sin. I explained to you very clearly, God judges sin. And some of you are facing judgment. Let me tell you the good news. God is not willing, he is not wanting people to perish or be judged. He wants everyone to come to repentance and the God who judges sin made a choice. I will be judged on your behalf. He was the one who never sinned, and yet he allowed himself to be beaten and crucified to pay for your sin so you don't have to pay. God can reach down and do a miracle inside of you before this day is finished. You could be right with God. Some of you, I'm giving a challenge right now. How many of you, if you were honest, you'd say, Pastor Greg, I am not right with God. If the rapture happened today, that would not be good news for me. But I want to get right. I want to turn from my sin. While our heads are bowed, if that's you, I want you to do one thing. I want you to lift up your hand. Pastor Greg, I want to pray. I see that hand at the back. God bless you. How many others? Thank you. Your people are responding. Others, lift up your hand. I'm not saved. I know that. I want to get right. Lift up your hand right now. God loves you. He's dealing with people. Lift up your hand. Others, you need Jesus. Some of you are backslidden. What a fearful thing it would be 
to have known Jesus. And on the day when millions disappear, you are still here. How many backsliders? Lift up your hand. I want to get right with God. I want to turn from my sin. God judges sin. Amen. Over there. Thank you. I appreciate that. God bless you. Amen. You can put your hand down. Others. God's dealing with people. Some are unsaved. Some are backslidden. Lift your hand right now. God loves you. He wants to help you. He can do a miracle inside of you all across this place. How many would there be? You've got to make your choice. God bless you, young man. Others, the Spirit of God is dealing. This is the love of God. He warns people in advance. There are people here. You're not right. God had me preach this because he's dealing with you. And he wants to give you a chance. Others, quickly, we're going to change the service in a moment. I want to give another opportunity. If you've not lifted your hand yet, do it right now. Hold it up. Put it right back down. I need Jesus. Here's my hand. I see that hand. Thank you. Others, I want to get right with God. Unsaved or backslidden. I don't want to miss the rapture. I don't want to face judgment. Anybody else, lift up your hand. Hold it up. Put it right back down. Thank God. God's dealing with people. I want only those that lifted their hands look up at me. Amen. You meant that? Yes. You meant that? You meant that? Yes. You meant that over there? Yes. Come out of your seat. Come here. I want to have someone pray with you. Come right now. God bless you. Just kneel down right here. God bless you. Thank you, man. I appreciate your honesty. God bless you. Just find a place to pray. Amen. Anthony is going to help you pray. Just kneel down there at the front. God bless you. There are people maybe near you, if you don't know if they're saved, why don't you gently invite them? Give them courage, help them to make a good decision. Let's all stand up to our feet. I gave a challenge. Some of you, your challenge is you're starting to look back. That must stop. You need to make sure you're right with God. Others, you have people you love. You need to be telling them Jesus is coming back. The altars are open. We're going to sing. Our brother is going to sing while people are coming. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light. upon Jesus. Turn your, your eyes, eyes upon Jesus. Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things, the things of, of earth will, will grow strangely dim in the light again turn your eyes upon Jesus turn your eyes upon Jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light 
it one more time. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Turn, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Let us worship God together. Thank him for his goodness. Hallelujah. Lord God, I am grateful for your goodness. God, we are grateful for your faithfulness. Lord God, hallelujah. Praise God, hallelujah. For I challenge you to consider, remember why Lot left us his old life. Consider the past and why you have turned away to follow me. Think of the steps that you have taken. Think of the work that I have done. Think of the saving grace that I have had upon you, upon your family, upon those that you have influenced. I challenge you to keep your face looking toward me, toward my coming and my expectations. Because it is not just your footsteps that are leading you away from destruction. As you follow me and my path, there are others that are coming behind you. There are others that are looking to you for direction. I challenge you in your community, in this day and age, in this time of urgency and limited hours, I compel you, my people, to begin to walk and increase the length of your steps from your old life. Step out and begin to run, press toward the mark and the prize, the upward call that is in Christ Jesus, and what I plan to do because there are many that are coming behind you, says God. Hallelujah, Lord God. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. If Jesus is coming back, believers need to make sure they are right with God, but secondly, they need to tell other people. There are people you come in contact with, people you love, tell them about this, because this is often a, the great motivation and spark in revival is when God moves on his people with the urgency of the time. So I'm encouraging you to do that. We're going to be dismissed.